Hey everyone, thank you so much for waiting. My name is Harshal Garg, and I'd like to welcome you guys to the first Nalanda Guides webinar. Today we'll be talking about the 13 colonies, which is one of the main topics within Unit 2 of the APUSH curriculum. And I'll spend about 25 to 30 minutes talking about it. And at the end, or about 10 to 15 minutes, I'll answer any questions you may have. You can, you can um, type the questions in the chat. So first off, I'd like to start with the general timeline. Here's a general timeline, it just has most of the important events, and you can look through it yourself. If you scroll down, you see a general map. In the map, you see all the major settlements of the 13 colonies, starting with Boston, then Plymouth, Providence, Hartford, New Haven, New York, Philadelphia, and even Jamestown. Also, um, Savannah and Charlestown are here. So the first topic are the initial British colonies. As you probably know, the first colony, the first permanent British settlement, is Jamestown. As you remember from Unit 1, Roanoke was a colony established in 1585, but it failed as the British couldn't deliver supplies and provisions in time, and the colonists, event colonists eventually died or disappeared. So after that failed Roanoke mission, there are two rival merchant groups competing for charters to the colonies. As you probably know by this time, instead of, ha instead of having royal control over the colonies, there are companies that went to the colonies to quickly extract wealth from the colonies. So two of these trading companies of merchants were competing for influence in the U.S. East Coast. One of them was the London Merchant Group, a group of merchants from London, and the second one was the Plymouth Merchant Group, a group of merchants from Plymouth in England. So basically, in 1606, King James I of England split the U.S. East Coast into two charters, giving the London Company the entire east, the southern part of the East Coast, and the, and the Plymouth Company, the northern part of the East Coast. So in 1607, a group of 100 men from the London Company, among them John Smith, who was one of the commanders of the Roanoke Mission, established Jamestown in present-day Virginia. Since these people were from a company and weren't trying to stay there permanently, they sought to quickly extract the wealth and they weren't prepared for the hardships they may face, so they didn't bring enough food with them or enough supplies, and they struggled to survive. So for that reason, John Smith, who was the commander, had to negotiate with the local Indians to get food. The local Indians were called the Powhatan Confederacy, led by Powhatan. So John Smith helped them acquire food, and he traded food with the natives, and the natives also helped them with agricultural technologies. So the natives helped them farm, and the natives helped them grow corn, and also, sometimes John Smith even stole food from the natives. Eventually, the London Company was renamed to the Virginia Company and they created settlements throughout most of present-day Virginia, establishing the Virginia Colony. To promote settlement, they gave free passage from England to poor people. But as I said earlier, because they struggled to earn food, the winter of 1610 was called the Starving Time. And this is because the Indians actually realized that the English were a threat to them, so the Indians stopped giving food to them. Eventually, Jamestown and the Virginia colony was on the brink of collapse because many, many ships from England that were supposed to deliver supplies were either sunk at sea or trapped. But then, when it was just about to collapse, one ship finally arrived and, giving, and gave supplies to them. On that ship was Lord de la War, who became the first um, governor of Virginia. And because Virginia was actually a company charter and it was meant to extract profits, Lord de la War had such a hard discipline for all of his colonists as he forced them to work. Later came John Rolfe, who was one of the colonists, and he discovered tobacco cultivation. I think the Indians must have taught him how to cultivate tobacco, and he spread the idea of tobacco cultivation, which generated a lot of wealth. But the only problem with, to with tobacco cultivation is that it required a lot of land, so the English had to push the Indians off of their land. Later, to encourage more settlement, they initiated the head right system, which would allow, in which they would give head rights or 50 acre plots to anyone who would migrate from England to the Americas. And most of the, the problem was that most of, the head, most of these head rights were placed on Indian territory, so the Indians often led raids onto the English settlements because the English had to push onto Indian territory to plant tobacco. Eventually, in 1619, met the first House of Burgesses, which is the Legislative Assembly of um, Virginia. But eventually, in 1624, King James I revoked the company charter and made Virginia a royal colony. 
and this was because um, this was because the company wasn't profitable because tobacco while tobacco was profitable and generated profits it was very expensive and it was too expensive to plant and still the colonists struggled to make a living and get enough food so by 1624 it became a royal colony ruled directly by the British government instead of from a local company now you've all probably heard of Pocahontas from the Disney movie Pocahontas was actually the daughter of Chief Powhatan who was the leader of the Powhatan Confederacy, the local Indians at Jamestown. John Rolfe, the same guy who discovered the tobacco uh, cultivation, kidnapped her and married her, and both of them fled to England, and later Pocahontas died in England. Later on, in 1642, King Charles I of England appointed Sir William Berkeley as the governor of Virginia. Berkeley sought to expand tobacco production, which was problematic because it required a lot of land, so the English had to push onto Indian land, and the Indians got really mad. So the English negotiated a treaty with them, saying that the, saying that the English would settle on the east of, east of the treaty line, and the Indians can have all land west of the treaty line. However, many people still settled on the west side of the treaty line. One of those people was Nathaniel Bacon, a recent Cambridge grad who came to the Americas. He was west of the treaty line, but and Indians kept raiding a settlement, but Sir, Sir William Berkeley didn't do anything about it because he was west of the treaty line, so he couldn't really do much about it. So because of that, Bacon raised his own army to attack the Indians, but Berkeley got mad and declared Bacon a rebel. So Bacon decided to divert his army eastward to Jamestown and attack Berkeley. Eventually, Bacon took over and put forced Berkeley into exile. Bacon forced Berkeley into exile, and this became known as Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, but eventually later on, the British troops came and helped Berkeley take over again. And eventually in 1677, the Indians signed a treaty with the English, which gave more land to the English. So a general summary of the Bacon's Rebellion is that the English won more land, and the Indians were forced to cede land to the, to the English. Now moving to the Maryland colony. Before I start, for your reference, Lord is a title given to a certain person within the English nobility, and this title gets passed on to the Lord's son when the Lord dies. So George Calvert was an English Lord given the title Lord Baltimore, and he was an English Catholic. And at this time, England was Anglican, so he wanted a Catholic colony for all the English, Angli all the English Catholics to get refuge from the Anglican rule. But he died before he could secure a charter, so his son, Cecilius Calvert, got the charter in 1632. Cecilius Calvert was known as the second Lord Baltimore. He was a son of the original Lord Baltimore, and he inherited the title. He, he was a proprietor of the colony, and he only, had to pay a, he only had to pay a small fee to the British nobility to own this colony. Now, unlike Virginia, which was a company charter, Maryland and many of the other colonies we'll see later on were proprietary colonies. Proprietary colonies were ruled by a proprietor who resides in England and acts as an absolute ruler, and the proprietor would dispatch a local governor to see the affairs of the colony. And unlike company charters, these proprietary colonies would not seek to extract the wealth quickly. Rather, they would want to create a permanent settlement in the colony and slowly extract the wealth. And for this reason, they were more prepared for the hardships they may face. So, so Cecilius dispatched his governor, his uh, brother, Leonard Calvert, as a governor to Maryland. And Calvert, Leonard Calvert wanted many not wanted more people to migrate from England, so he allowed non-Catholics to migrate. But to his surprise, more Protestants actually migrated than Catholics, so because of that, he had to sign the Toleration Act of 1649 to put more Protestants in power, to, to allow Protestants to, um, to have a say in the government. But eventually, the Protestants hated that the Catholics had control of the government, so the Protestants revolted in a civil war, and the Protestants repealed the Toleration Act, taking control of the government. Now let's move on to the New England colonies. So Puritans were a religious group in England that were Calvinists, which is a branch of Protestantism. These Puritans sought to purify the Anglican Church of all of its Catholic elements. Now if you recall, Anglicanism, Anglicanism is like a branch of Protestantism, but it actually has some Catholic elements, as Anglicanism is known to glorify the, the English king. For example, it had a hierarchy of bishops subordinate to the English king, and it also has ornate ceremonies to commemorate the English king. These are not Protestant elements, so Puritans are devout Protestants 
who sought to purify Anglicanism of all of its Protestant, all of its Catholic elements by removing all of these extra elements to glorify the king. But because of this, because English, England was Anglican and Catholic, Puritans often faced persecution in England, so they sought to go to the colonies in exile. Some Puritans were known as separatists who sought to separate from the Anglican Church, while others were non-separatists who wanted to stay with the Anglican Church. In 1620, a group of separatists led by William Bradford set sail on the Mayflower to Plymouth, Massachusetts, and unlike Virginia, these people actually developed great relations with the natives as the natives taught them agricultural techniques. And as I said earlier, this is one of the most com this is one of the most common themes at this time as the natives were crucial to the survival of the English. While the English often fought with the Indians over territory, the Indians were actually crucial to the survival of the English, and the English wouldn't have survived without the English help, without the Indians help. In fact, in 1621, the natives and the English had a meal together in Plymouth, which is commonly known to us at Thanksgiving. And every every uh, November, we still celebrate Thanksgiving, which actually originated from this meal, in which the English and the Indians shared a meal. But later on, more Puritans wanted exile, and these were actually non-separatists who still wanted a connection with the English church. So John Winthrop established the Massachusetts Bay Company, and he secured a charter to found the colony of Massachusetts. And he promoted the idea of a congregational church, in which there are many separate independent Puritan churches with no, author with no authority toward a larger institution. Contrast this with um, the Catholic churches of Europe, in which all the Catholic churches are independent, but they all have the authority of the, but the Pope has authority over all of them. Unlike that, congregational churches, congregational churches in Massachusetts were all independent, and there's no sort of higher institution that all of them had to be subordinate to. However, the, the problem was that only Puritans who attend church could vote or hold office, and non-Puritans weren't, weren't allowed to vote. So for that reason, Thomas Hooker, who was a non-Puritan church minister from Newtown, led his congregation to Hartford to establish the colony of Connecticut. Similarly, Roger Williams, who believed in separation of church and state, was banished for publicly saying his views, and he led his congregation to establish the colony of Rhode Island in the city, around the city of Providence. And what's special about Roger Williams is that his colony of Rhode Island tolerated all religions, including Jews. But before he created the colony of Rhode Island, he actually took refuge with the local Narragansett Indians, and this is just another example of how the Indians were crucial to the survival of the English. Now furthermore, Anne Hutchinson was another dissident who believed that the Puritan church in Massachusetts was bad and corrupt. She believed that all church ministers were among the non-elect, and that means that in Calvinist ideology basically, the Calvinists believed in the idea of predestination in which God had predestined a group of people to go to heaven. But Anne Hutchinson believed that all the church ministers of Massachusetts are among the non-elect, or that they weren't predestined to go to heaven. So she was banished for publicly saying her views, but her followers, led by John Wheelwright, established the colony of New Hampshire. And just like the Indians were crucial to the survival of the English, they often fought the English due to English encroachment on Indian land. Two of these wars were the Peacock War and the King Philip's War both with which had huge casualties for both sides. The next set of colonies is called the Restoration Colonies. This is called the Restoration Colonies because King Charles II financed these colonies after the Stuart Restoration. So basically, in the so basically what happened is that King Charles I ruled like an absolute ruler in which he dismissed Parliament from 1629 to 1640. But then he called Parliament again in 1640 because he wanted to get money, he wanted, to raise, he wanted Parliament to raise money and give him money so he could crush a rebellion in Ireland. But then Parliament refused to give him the money because King Charles I gave himself absolute authority and didn't give any authority to Parliament. So for that reason, King Charles I and Parliament fought a civil war, known as the English Civil War, lasting from 1642 to 1649, and the Parliament organized an army under Oliver Cromwell, and eventually in 1649, Oliver Cromwell won, and he actually restored parliamentary power, giving the king, not, giving the king less power, and he was actually a Puritan. But later on, after Oliver Cromwell died in 1660, 
King Charles I's son, King Charles II, took power, and he actually restored the English monarchy. He restored the absolute rule of the English monarch, giving Parliament less power, which is known as the Stuart Restoration. So Charles I financed many colonies, and all these colonies were known as the Restoration Colonies, in honor of the Stuart Restoration. These colonies were called proprietary colonies as they were run by proprietors who were wealthy landlords that resided in England. And unlike companies, as I said earlier, unlike companies that sought to quickly colonize the lands to ensure quick commercial success, these proprietors would live in England and rule the company over a long period of time, acting as absolute leaders. So the first colony is Carolina, which was chartered in 1663. It had religious freedom and it wanted people to migrate there, but no one really came there. So one of the original proprietors, Anthony Ashley Cooper, given the title Earl of Shatesbury, believed that they should fund migrants from England to Carolina. Later on, the capital of Charlestown, now known as Charleston, South Carolina, was established in 1690. Also, Anthony Ashley Cooper created the Fundamental Constitution for Carolina in 1669, which was inspired by John Locke, one of the Enlightenment thinkers who believed in promoting freedom and equality among all men. Later on, the northern and southern regions developed very differently. The north, the north was mostly based on subsistence farming and had few slaves and few wealthy people. It was mostly full of poor subsistence farmers, while the south had lots of slaves and a few wealthy landlords who owned most of the territory. The south also had close ties with Barbados, which was a British colony in, in the Caribbean with the thriving slave market, and this is how it acquired so many slaves. So basically, North Carolina was more decentralized and in the hands of a lot of poor people, while, the, while South Carolina was mostly ruled by wealthy people, wealthy landowners with lots of slaves. So because of that, the colony was divided in 1729. The next colony is New York. So in 1664, one year after the Carolina Charter, King Charles II gave his brother, James, known as the Duke of York, all the land encompassing present-day New York and New Jersey. However, the Dutch had control of, the new, of new York, which was known to them as New Netherland. And also, they had control of present-day New York City, which was known to them as New Amsterdam. So the English fleet, led by Richard Nicholson, took over New Amsterdam and fully established control by 1674. New York had lots of diversity and a huge wealth gap. And this was a problem because there were a few wealthy people who were loyal to James, the Duke of York, but there were a lot of poor people who resented the wealthy. Now, New Jersey was created because James's original charter also included a bunch of other territories, including present-day New Jersey. But all of his settlers, all of his colonists settled in New York, so New Jersey was empty. So because of that, he just gave the New Jersey territory to Sir George Carteret, who was one of the original proprietors of Carolina. Carteret was born on Jersey Island, which is an island between the UK and France, so he named this place New Jersey. And unlike New York, New Jersey was mostly agricultural and rural, and it had no wealthy class, it was a lot poorer, and it had no major cities. So because of this, it was profitless, and it became a royal colony in 1702, ruled directly from the British crown. And the next colony is Pennsylvania. It was created by William Penn, who was a son of a very rich Irish landlord, and he converted to Quakerism. Quaker, the Quakers were a group of Puritans who were more radical, and they believed they rejected the idea of predestination. Predestination is basically the idea, the Calvinist idea, that God had predestined, God had selected a few people to go to heaven, but they rejected this idea, saying that anyone can go to heaven. And they also, they were more radical. They believed in nonviolence, and they believed that women can uh, can be part of the clergy. So William Penn was the son of a rich Irish landlord. He converted to Quakerism, and because Quakers were very radical, they were often persecuted and jailed in England. So Penn wanted a colony for all the Quakers to go. So that's why. So he actually inherited some of his father's property, and among those was a debt claim from King Charles II. But Charles II was short on debt, so instead of giving him money, he just gave him the colony of Pennsylvania. Now, what's special about Pennsylvania is that the people there actually had good relations with the Indians. This is because William Penn believed that the that the Indians owned the land. So he reimbursed the Indians for all the land they lost and never had a conflict with them. And the thing here is that many people opposed William Penn's autocratic rule. So William Penn decided to create a legislature called, um, 
called the Charter of Liberties, which creates one legislative assembly. Also, he created the city of Philadelphia in 1682, which means brotherly love. Now, the Charter of Liberties, which William Penn created, which was a legislative assembly, also allowed the three poorer counties of Pennsylvania to have their own legis legislative assembly. These three counties eventually became known as Delaware, and Delaware became separated later on. And now the final colony is the colony of Georgia. Georgia was created by General James Oglethorpe, who advocated for a colony in Georgia. He was a military general during Queen Anne's War, which is commonly known as the War of Spanish Succession, and he believed that a, war, that a colony in the location of present-day Georgia would be a barricade against Spanish expansion from Florida. So he wanted a colony there to prevent this, to block the Spanish and, and um, protect the Carolinas. Furthermore, he hated that so many English debtors or English, English impoverished people that were in jail for having so much debt were dying in jail. So he wanted a colony for all of those impoverished people in England to come to and start a new life. So for that reason, in 1732, he was given the charter for present-day Georgia, and he established the town of Savannah in 1733. And one thing about him is that he had strict rules in which he banned all Catholics and slaves, but he, re he repealed some of those rules after a lot of revolts. Now the final part of my lecture is about reor reorganizing the colonies and some general patterns among the colonies. So after establishing these colonies, Britain sought to gain wealth from the colonies, and it needed to monopolize trade with them. Britain believed that, th that, that the colonies could be sources of raw materials and markets of manufactured goods. Now, if you remember from world history, you remember that, um, <coughs> that the, the colonies of the Americas supplied raw materials to Europe, and Europeans manufactured them into finished goods, which were then sold to the colonists back in the Americas. Britain wanted to do something like this. So Britain wanted to monopolize all trade with its colonies, so it passed the Navigation Act, which prevents any non-British ship from docking at a British colonial port, and also mandates all ships from the 13 colonies to stop at Britain on its way to the rest of Europe. Many hated this, and in fact Massachusetts refused to comply with the Navigation Acts, so King James II revoked their colonial charter, made it a royal colony, and created the Dominion of New England, which is a group of colonies consisting of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, all led by Sir Edmund Andros, who was appointed by James II. And many hated Sir Edmund Andros because he strictly enforced the Navigation Act. Later in 1689, Parliament opposed James II for being Catholic and they feared he might make England a Catholic state. So Parliament overthrew him and put his daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, in power. James II peacefully gave up the throne, hence the name Glorious, because he didn't want another civil war like his grandfather, King Charles I. So basically, the Glorious Revolution was when the English monarchy was over, the English absolute monarchy was overthrown and turned into a parliamentary state. So this had many effects in the Americas. In fact, there are three overthrowings of autocratic rules in the Americas, similar to the Glorious Revolution. In Massachusetts, the colonists were inspired by the Glorious Revolution to overthrow Sir Edmund Andros, who had been, who had been ruling autocratically. So they um, imprisoned him and forced him to give up the throne, and they also reinstated the legislature, similar to what happened in the Glorious Revolution, where the parliament got more power. Now in New York, the middle class, led by Jacob Leisler, overthrew the upper class and overthrew Captain Francis Nicholson, who was a governor who favored the wealthy class. And this was also inspired by the Glorious Revolution. So he took over in 1689, but in 1691, William and monarchs, monarchs William and Mary chose a new governor. And similarly, in Maryland, John Cood hated the autocratic rule of Lord Baltimore, and he um, removed the authority of Lord Baltimore in 1689, as he was Catholic, and John Coode established Anglicanism in Maryland. Now I'll just talk about a few general ideas among the colonies. The first one is tobacco production. It was started by John Rolfe in Virginia, and it became super common throughout the British colonies because it was um, it yielded huge profits and also it was very addictive in England. Compare this with the with the opium production. How the British grew opium in India and traded with China, as opium was really addictive in China. Also, it was very common among the South, especially later on in like. South Carolina and Georgia and other places. One thing is that it required lots of land, so the English often had to push the Indians off their land, and this was one of the main themes of this time period. 
because the, the English often had to push the Indians off their land and had lots of conflicts with them, yet the Indians were so crucial to the survival of the English. And finally, we come to the relations between Indians and English. This is obviously the, one of the most important themes, because the Indians, while they had many conflicts, the Indians were actually crucial to the survival because the English weren't used to farming in Virginia because the climate was very different. So the Indians helped them farm. They taught them how to grow corn. They taught them that growing beans alongside corn replenished the soil. They taught them how to clear fields and uh, many other things. In fact, during some of the wars, some Indians that during some of the wars, like Peacock War and King Philip's War, some Indians that rivaled the other English, tr the other Indian tribes, helped the English spy on the Indians and guide them through the villages. Some Indians even converted to Christianity, and these were known as the Praying Indians. The, the English also traded with the Indians, which was crucial to um, economic success. And finally, middle grounds were places in which the Indi Indians and English shared roughly the same land and lived in close proximity with others. Here, the English learned the Indian traditions of respect and giving gifts, and they developed close relations with, with each other. So now I'll just give a general summary of what I talked about. So first you have the initial colonies of Virginia and Maryland. Virginia was a company charter that sought to quickly extract profits, but it failed to earn, but it, but it struggled initially because it, it wasn't prepared for the hardships they may face. They weren't prepared to settle there and actually plant food there. They, they only wanted to earn profits. And that's why as it was on the brink of collapse, a new ship arrived to give them provisions. And eventually it, it started to survive and actually grow in population. Later you have Maryland, which is a proprietary colony, not ruled by a company, but ruled by a proprietor who is an English lord who resided in England and dispatched a local governor to the colony. Next, you have the New England colony, starting with Plymouth, which is um, a Puritan colony, and then you have the Massachusetts Bay colony, which is also for Puritans. Then you have Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, which, is, which were all established by dissidents of the Massachusetts Bay colony. Then after the Stuart Restoration in England, you have the Restoration Colonies, including Carolina, which split into North and South due to regional differences in the economy. Then you have New York, which was taken over, which was taken over from the Dutch. Then you have New Jersey, which was created by extra land in New York. And then you have Pennsylvania, which was created as a, as a place of exile for the Quakers. And finally, you have the, the Georgia Colony, which was created as a barricade against um, Spanish Florida. And then you have English trying to dominate trade with, it, with its colonies, so they passed the Navigation Act, but eventually these failed in the long term and it led to the American Revolution. And then you see a common theme throughout this entire time, the relationship between English and Indians, that while the English had conflicts with the Indians, the English couldn't have survived without the Indians. So now that